All right, it's 5.30. Let's get rolling. No time like the present. We are in module number three. Working our way through the content for ten, Pen Test Plus. This week it'll be on understanding information gathering and reconnaissance. And as usual, there is a, uh, a quick little do I know this. Uh, reconnaissance is always the initial step in a cyber attack. For a pen test, this means scanning an enumeration using a tool like DNS Recon, as shown here, to gather initial information about a target before moving to different types of scans and gathering additional information. Once DNS Recon has provided results, an attacker can move forward with Nmap scans to see what kinds of services the hosts are running. Funny enough, in the Pentest Plus exam, they pretend as though you don't have access to the man page and you're unable to uh, get help on running NMAP. So for the test, you will need to remember the various flags of NMAP and what scan does what. In real life, I highly suggest getting yourself the NMAP network scanning book by the guy who created NMAP. It is a super useful resource. But you also have the internet and always being able to type man and map and getting the list. Common active reconnaissance can be various forms of enumeration, such as the host, the network, the user, the group, the network share, a web page, an application, a service, or even packet crafting. External enumeration is one of the first things you would do in a pen test. Determining uh, the internet facing host of a target network can bring out your very first targets. These devices should be behind a firewall, allowing minimal exposure to the services that are running. A port scan will tell you the services or enumerate the services that are running on the exposed host. Uh, like I said, a TCP SYN scan, which is a lowercase s, uppercase s, or a TCP connect, lowercase s, uppercase t, uh, will see if a port is open. One of three responses will come back. It'll either be open, closed, or filtered. So this is uh, the SYN scan will run just sending a SYN packet to start the three-way handshake. Uh, TCP Connect will make the full three-way handshake and then disconnect. A UDP port scan is lowercase s, uppercase u. And you'll get one of these back. Either it'll be open, the service is listening, it'll be closed, or open slash filtered, where we didn't get a response from a target. So it could be firewall, or it could be timed out. If a scan is detected and blocked by a firewall, the fin scan using the, the fin flag, lowercase s, uppercase f, will help you determine if a target port is actually opened or closed. So if you run an initial scan like the ones from earlier, and it says it's being blocked by a firewall, you want to verify that that is true by running 
a thin scan. If the, uh, the port is closed, you'll get a reset. Otherwise, the, uh, the packet will be dropped. So if you get a reset back, then that port is more than likely closed. Otherwise, you just got a verification that it's, it might be open. A ping, a ping scan is one of the most common types, sending a echo uh, request. Mind you, these are pretty loud and pretty easy to see on things like Wireshark or be able to detect by other tools. So I wouldn't always recommend running a ping scan, but you should be aware that it's lowercase n, or lowercase s, lowercase n. Once you have scanned the ports of a target, then we go into the various types of enumeration. Well, the first one is the host. It is one of the first tasks that you can do internally or externally. If you're doing it externally, you want to limit the IP addresses you're scanning to reduce the chance of scanning any addresses that are outside of your scope. Internally though, you can scan the full subnet used by the target. We could also do users. Gathering a valid list of users is the first step in cracking credentials. Windows networks can normally be manipulated with the server message block, which is normally port 445. Here are two examples of using the SMB com negotiate. The client tells the server what protocols, flags, and options it would like to use. SMB com session setup and X is used for authentication. Nmap has a script called the SMB num users that can be ran to brought out the number of users in a system. Something like this. So you can absolutely use Nmap to not only scan ports, but bring out the list of users in a Windows system. You can also use Nmap to bring out the number of the groups that exist. Now, if you notice in this command, we have a username and password. So it doesn't just work just by running the script on a Windows machine. You have to have some credential to be able to do this. But hey, you might be lucky and a administrator used some very simple username password and you're able to get in right away. Another uh, NSC script available to you is the network share. Identifying systems that are sharing files, folders, and printers. That can help you in building out your attack surface. Getting onto a system, you might be able to find out, hey, this, this folder is being shared and anybody can access it. That can be used as a way to pivot within the network. There's also one for web servers that can brute force directory and file paths of web apps. Which again, useful for enumeration, useful to find out what is on this system. Neat 
Nikto, Nikto is another tool that does uh, web vulnerability scanning. It is a noisy scanner and can be detected. Uh, it's This is more of here is a tool on the list. I wouldn't necessarily go for it right away because it is a very noisy scanner. And if you're conducting a pen test, you want to be as quiet as possible. Having the right credentials can bring you quite the amount of information. So not only the users and groups, you can also see the running services on a Windows system with Nmap. Pretty crazy. There's also a few others. Like passive reconnaissance. If you're starting with a, a domain and nothing else, you could use things like Google and using the, uh, the site function in Google to bring out what websites are related to a specific domain. There's an awesome tool that I like. It's called DNS Dumpster that can reveal information about a domain. And you can also do things like dig and MS lookup to perform things like zone transfers and get information about the domain as well. Some of these can be detected and some can't. For example, DNS dumpster uh, may not be as, a, as easy to detect. Uh, using Google to search is definitely not detectable because it's all using public information. Dig and NS lookup maybe if you are watching your DNS traffic. Um, there's also packet inspection and eavesdropping. Having tools like Wireshark or TCP dump to capture and analyze traffic on a network can be a way of doing passive reconnaissance. Because you're watching all the packets that are coming in and out, you'll be able to see what's happening as much as possible because you know, the things like HTTPS will make life difficult, but being inside the network and being able to scan and, and uh, capture packets can bring in a wealth of information. Open source intelligence is the other. Uh, that is, again, one of those really hard to detect because it's happening with open source tools. That could be a, a Google search to running things like Recon NG and Shodan, which uh, good luck detecting because it's not really hitting your network. Automated vulnerability scanners work in a similar fashion to this. So something like Nmap performs the host and port enumeration scans for possible more ports. When it has enough information, it'll determine what software and version number are running on those specific open ports and records that information. The scanner would then try to determine if the software that's listening on a specific port is susceptible to known vulnerabilities. So that would be by correlating a database of known vulnerabilities against information recorded and then producing the result of what it could be. Basically a, a general uh, explanation of how things like Nmap works.
there are different kinds of vulnerability scans. We have things like unauthenticated, which only shows the network services that are exposed, doesn't use credentials, and would be your method of black box pen testing. You have the authenticated, which is the complete opposite. You have credentials so you can get a full picture of the surface. There's discovery. That's identifying the attack surface of a target by using Nmap. There is the fool, enabling every scanning option in the scan policy. And that's kind of a, a reference to Nessus's plugin categories. There's also stealth. Uh, using passive vulnerability scanners that monitor and analyze traffic and use the information gathered from those packets to determine possible vulnerabilities. Like this picture of having a client and a server, a span port on the switch, and watching the traffic, like the web traffic, and realizing that the client is running Internet Explorer 7 and the server is running Apache 621. You can take those two and find vulnerabilities for both. Nessus can handle compliance, which is the last type of vulnerability scan, so that uh, you can you run it against systems and you see, hey, is this is this system meeting the compliance of major laws like HIPAA? The challenge there becomes interpreting the various compliance requirements across different industries and government agencies. So doing things like fine tuning or custom scans will help you for various engagements that you might face. Now here are some challenges that you need to think about when you're gonna run a vulnerability scan. Number one is the best time to run a scan. Unless it's really custom and really specific, your scan will cause a lot of noise on production networks that could result in significant congestion. That's not good for the client. Your scan could also crash a target or network infrastructure. You also don't want that at all. You want to be able to run your scan and it not bring down the infrastructure. Uh, another challenge is what protocols are being used. Knowing what protocols are being used by the target is important. You could miss vulnerabilities if you don't include everything that's being used, like TCP and UDP. The last thing you want when you're running a vulnerability scan is to not get a full picture of the target. There's also network topology. If you're scanning across a WAN connection, that's going to impact what devices are along the path. A good rule of thumb is to perform the scan as close as possible to the target. So of course, you're going to have to deal with things like firewalls and other devices that could impact the results of your scan. You have to keep all those things in mind. There's also bandwidth limitation. Again, scans are noisy. So you need to be cognizant of the noise that you're creating on a, on a line and know what the limit is. Because you may run the entire bandwidth with your noisy scan. And that, again, is not good for the client. You might overwhelm the system and crash it. Or you might just bring their work down to a crawl. And neither is a good thing. This also query throttling. Limiting the number of requests that the target would need to respond 
to would reduce the risk of causing issues like crashing. And another challenge that you must think about are the fragile or non-traditional assets. Things like printers, Internet of Things, and others may not be capable of handling vulnerability scanning. They have a lot of minimal resources, so they may crash and, and be bricked by your scan. So again, knowing what target you're working with, you need to adjust your scan for it. Running the vulnerability scan is the easiest part. The hard part is interpreting those results, removing the false positives, from the final report. So this involves looking at the results in a detailed format and being thorough with the result provided from the tool. You should do things like manual checking, verifying the CVE is, is exploitable. Uh, you don't want to take the results from a vulnerability scan as just truth. You always must verify. There are a number of helpful sources that you can look into like the US CERT, the CERT division, Carnegie Mellon University, NIST, and so on that will help you in verifying the the result of the scan. As a pen tester your goal is to identify weaknesses that can be exploited. The ultimate way to verify a vulnerability is to exploit it. As a general rule, if a vulnerability has a matching module and metasploit, it should almost always be considered high severity because a lot of the, the malicious actors that we deal with are all script kiddies. So they're just going to run the easiest tool to get the quickest result. And Metasploit is one of those ways of doing that. So addressing some of these following questions can help you determine the priority at which you should address the vulnerabilities found. You know, using information from like the CVE, what is the severity of the vulnerability? How many systems does this vulnerability apply to? How is it detected? Was it found using an automated scanner or was it found manually? What's the value of the device on which the vulnerability was found? Is that device critical to business or infrastructure? Uh, what's the attack vector? Does it apply to your environment? And is there a workaround? A standard protocol is always to handle the highest severity stuff first and then work your way down uh, vulnerabilities on critical systems and so on down the, the chain. Using the CVE information is definitely useful in building that list of uh, what we need to handle first. But again, just because it, it was brought up by a scanner like Nessus doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct and you have to deal with it. Always verify the scan. Chapter 4 covers social engineering attacks. And it's really more of a brief overview of these various attacks. Starting with good old phishing. An attacker presenting a link to a user or an attachment to a user that it looks valid, that looks from a trusted resource. As soon as they click on it, then anything could happen.
There's farming. Threat actors redirecting victims from a valid website or resource to a malicious one that is made to appear as the valid. The attacker then extracts confidential information or installs malware on the victim system. Farming is typically done by altering the host file on the client system, successfully poisoning a DNS server, or exploiting a vulnerability in the DNS server. Malvertising uses malicious ads on trusted websites, resulting in a user's browser being inadvertently redirected to a site hosting malware. So if you thought ads in and of themselves were bad, it is completely possible to make an ad show up that is malicious in a legitimate site. Talk about new ways of working around the uh, system set in place. There is spear phishing, and a phishing attempt that is constructed in a very specific way and target to a specific individual or a specific company. The attacker will normally study a victim and the organization in order to be able to make the email look legitimate and perhaps make them appear from, to come from a trusted user. So whereas a phishing attempt is just everywhere, a spear phishing attempt is going to take some time to craft. It is not done overnight. There's SMS phishing, using text messages to send malware links. There's uh, voice phishing, or vishing. It, that's more of a social engineering attack using a phone conversation. I'm sure you've gotten those calls of the IRS saying that there's a, a warrant out for your arrest if you hang up. Yes, so with vishing, the attacker persuades the user to reveal private information, private personal information, and financial information, or any information about a person or a company. They may impersonate and spoof caller ID in order to obfuscate themselves when performing this type of attack. There's also whaling. Similar to phishing and spear phishing, but whaling is an attack targeted at a high-profile business executive or a key individual in a corporation. They tend to look like critical business email or something from someone who has legal authority internally or externally. Elicitation is the act of gaining knowledge or information from people. Interrogators can ask good open-ended questions to learn about an individual's viewpoints, their values, and their goals. This information can be used to continue gathering additional information from someone else. Interrogators can ask closed-ended questions to get more control of the conversation or to stop it. Asking too many questions can normally cause a victim to shut down the interaction, and asking too few questions is kind of awkward. Successful social engineers use a narrowing approach in their questions to gain the most information from their victim. They also look at things like the victim's posture or body language, uh, the color of the victim's skin, the direction of the victim's head and eyes, the movement of the hands and feet, 
uh, mouth and lip expressions, the pitch and rate of a victim's voice, as well as any changes. Um, and they could even look at the words, the length of the words, the number of syllables as functions and pauses. Pretexting, or just another way of saying impersonation, is when an attacker presents as someone else in order to gain access to information. It could be quick and simple, like pretending to be someone in the organization, or much more complex, in creating a whole new identity and manip manipulating the receipt of information. Some of the motivations for social engineers could be things like uh, uh, authority, showing confidence in authority, either legal, organizational, or social authority. They can motivate their victim through things like scarcity and urgency, feeling uh, an urgency in a decision-making context. So specific language can be used to heighten that urgency and be able to manipulate the people. Salespeople are social engineers. They use the, the scarcity and urgency. Like they'll tell you the sale is only for the day or there's limited supply. Social engineers can also use social proof, a psychological phenomenon in which an individual is not able to determine the appropriate mode of behavior. Social engineers use this tactic when an individual enters an unfamiliar situation that he or she doesn't know how to deal with, enabling this person and any others to be easily manipulated. There is likeness, using human vulnerabilities such as aesthetically pleasing, being appreciated and talked about, can also be used to manipulate a victim. And uh, of course, there is nothing like fear to manipulate a person to act promptly. Fear is a unpleasant emotion based on the belief that something bad or dangerous may take place. It is absolutely used by social engineers to get their victims to act quickly to avoid or rectify a dangerous or painful situation. From these ways, we move on to another social, uh, sorry, sh shoulder surfing, being able to obtain personally identifiable information just by looking over a victim's shoulder, getting close enough to see what they're typing. It's possible to carry this far away using binoculars or telescopes or small cameras or microphones. This is very prevalent in crowded places. Of course, not now because we're still in pandemic, but you know, it happens. This last one's always fun. Simply leaving USB sticks unattended or placing them in strategic locations could be just enough to get a user to think the device is lost and, in and insert them into their system to figure out who it is to return it to. There's other ways of uh, dropping information, like uh, dropping a key ring containing the stick and pictures of kids or pets with an actual uh, key or two, even though the keys could be totally fake themselves, but you know, putting a, a key ring at a park, that could, that could trigger just enough. Uh, that personal touch may prompt the victim to try to identify the owner and return the keychain. This type of social engineering is usually pretty effective and could be catastrophic. Any questions on vulnerability scanners 
and social engineering. Okay. So here's the module three assignment. There are some links in Canvas to help you out. So I'll try to put these side by side. Here is Recon NG, both the GitHub and the Wiki for your, uh, for your reference. Pick a target. Run the tool and see what you find out. Recon NG does create a report, so you could totally submit that report as, as part of that. Um, in prior versions of this, I would, I would have people aim to CNN and uh, the results are enormous. But it's kind of cool to see the various things you could pick up on something like CNN. Uh, read through the set user manual, manual, the social engineering toolkit. Create two attacks of your choice against Windows VMs and see how it works. Again, it's all about, uh, it's all about doing. So run Recon NG. Pick a target. Like I said, I used to point students to CNN. It would take a while because CNN is huge, but you could pick a smaller organization and try out. Try even Cabrillo, see what you get. Run the set user, man, uh, the social engineering toolkit. See how uh, that works against a Windows VM that you create on, on the cloud. And then uh, there's two war games from Under the Wire, Century and Cyborg, that you can work through. And again, you would submit the, the, like, the answers that you found in doing those games. It's going to be a fun week of hacking. Any questions on the work this week?